Welcome to AEC Stories. This is former SM3 Dempsey from the USS Mount Hood. Today I've got a great new guest. I've met him through my friend James Spears on uh, the Navy, U.S. Navy Salty Dogs group. This is author and former Marine John Wood. How are you doing today, John? I'm doing real fine, Lynn. Thank you. So you figured out this technology, and I'm glad to have you on board. <laughs> so, some of my podcasts are a little scratchy. I'll have a guy in a speaker, and it's like, you know, it's like that gets to be a pain in the butt. Um, so usually on, on AEC stories, we kind of go into uh, what got you in the military and how that came about, like what's your sea story. And we include Marines in the sea stories and CBs, even though CBs might have just worked on land. They might have taken a boat or they might have been near the ocean. And Marines often serve on ships or in naval bases and naval stations. So how did you, uh, whatever made you decide to join the Marines? How did that come about for you? Well, there were two things. One, of course, it was right after the Second World War. And there was lots of uh, war stories, lots of uh, people in the neighborhood who had uh, uh, been overseas and so forth. And... Uh, and a lot of movies were coming out, and uh, there was just something about the something about the Marines that caught my attention. Uh, I remember being in the barber chair. I was about 15 years old or so, and uh, uh, Chick, who was the barber, had uh, returned from Korea, and uh, he said, "John, what do you what do you figure on doing with your life?" And I said, "Oh, I'm going to be a Marine." He said, "Oh hell," he said, "That's a long way off." He said, "You don't want to be a Marine anyway." Well, of course, that's, uh, that's a lot of years, over 50 years ago. <laughs> but uh, the, the movies came out, uh, the DI and uh, Battle Cry and those kinds of things, and they had uh, uh, displays in the lobbies of the theaters at that time, BARs and M30s and all that stuff, and it just wrapped me up. But the thing I saw in the movies a lot were the ships were burning, I didn't like that. And so I, thought, <laughs> I thought I was going to be smart. I wasn't going to join the Navy. I was going to join the Marines where I wouldn't have to be on any burning ships. Right. That was the that's, dumbest that's, thing that's, that's, a, that's a good way to look at it, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Little did I know. <laughs> well, that that's the irony because, you know, we the sailors are like, well, at least we won't have to do the landing in Normandy. Now look at those Marines, yeah. you know. But then, you know, after Vietnam, then when I came in, people were thinking, well, I don't want to go to the jungle. I'll just be safe on a ship, <laughs> you know. But really, the truth is none of those places are 100 percent safe, really. No, sir. Uh, maybe shore duty on an Air Force base. <laughs> Sorry, Air Force guys. I had to do that. <laughs> <laughs> so where, where did where did you grow up in? Uh, where did you join, and where did you get uh, sent off to? I was I, I, I was born and raised in uh, Flint, Michigan, and uh, I uh, joined the Marines in 1959, uh, fresh out of high school, and they sent me off to Detroit to be checked out and down to San Diego for my for my training. Uh, I uh, I did pretty good in that. I uh, made PFC out of boot camp. I was the right guy. And uh, made PFC out of boot camp, and uh, I worked for a gun uh, a gun sight company uh, uh, when I was a teenager. And because of that, uh, they made me a twenty one eleven, which was a small arms repairman and technician. And uh, they sent me to Quantico to school and a bunch of other schools uh, for small arms. I I was repairing everything from uh, twenty two caliber pistols up to one hundred six recoilless rifles. That's pretty cool. So you were like a gunsmith yeah, within yes, the military. Right. That's right. So you actually had a trade that you could use when you get out if you wanted, if you wanted to yes, go that way. Yes, uh, it served it served me well. The Marines served me well. It, uh, it, it has made a big difference in my life. Uh, and uh, when I decided to be a police officer or, or, or even a salesman or whatever, the way you carry yourself, the way you, you know, uh, uh, the way you present yourself and so forth. I, I remember seeing my, uh, uh, I had to go in for my uh, interview, uh, verbal interview with, uh, you know, with the police department. And later I saw the, uh, uh, my report 
And they said, entered the door, stopped, looked the room over, uh, carried himself straight and with Barry. Yeah. That's what you get from, uh, that's what you get from joining. So was, how, how tough was boot camp back then? Uh, I thought it was, uh, I thought it was pretty good. <laughs> you know, uh, <laughs> I got flumped in the chest a couple of times with a, with a rifle butt, but you know, uh, it scared you more than it hurt you. They knew exactly what they were doing and how they were going to do it. Uh, but I saw uh, I saw one guy uh, try to commit suicide while he was there. He drank uh, that stupid uh, printer's ink, you know, we used to mark our our clothes with and so forth. And he uh, uh, messed up the inner ears, uh, and, and he couldn't even sit up. He, he lost all sense of balance and everything. And as they drove off in the ambulance, the drill instructors were beating on it and yelling at him, you know, you punk, you punked out. <laughs> and this poor guy is... What, yeah, what a... <laughs> you know, he was going... <laughs> I, I sound, I sound unsympathetic with my laugh, but I mean, generations and different yeah. times, you know. <clears throat> Today they have stress cards and they have uh, timeouts and... Back then, it was hardcore. You're, they're going to make you hard by being hard on you. And uh, they made rough, tough men. I mean, men that were ready to do their job. So it's it's changed. I'm not saying that they, they're not adequate or very good today. They, I'm sure they've improved some things. Right. But looking back at those days, I mean, you know, Marine boot camp was probably one of the roughest in that era. And, uh, you know, even my dad, I, you know, he was a Marine officer and he broke his appendix doing pull-ups cause they were just making you run, do pull-ups, you know, jump out of a, a chopper into the ocean, you know, without a parachute, right. you know, like quick flybys, jump, you know, stuff like that. Right. Well, we, we had a, we had a guy that, uh, was a little, he was heavy, you know, and, uh, he was very strong. He was a football player, but he didn't have, uh, the endurance and we were running, and uh, he was falling behind, and they, they told us uh, to put towel. We tied our towels together and put them under his arms, you know, held him up and made him run, and he died. Oh, my gosh. Like, so, yeah, so he died right there. He died right there in our arms, you know, like uh, from exhaustion. That's, that is, yeah, it, uh, you didn't even need the battlefield. Was, uh, you were having it in boot camp, <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah, it was, uh, yeah, you know, they they didn't play around. These guys were uh, all of them were uh, were veterans, and, and at that time, uh, you had a lot of World War II guys, and you had a lot of uh, and uh, an awful lot of Korean uh, veterans. Yeah, and they all been in combat, and they were not there to to teach uh, uh, youngsters to not be Marines. That's for sure. Yeah, I mean that's the real devil dogs. That's the real you know go go at it and. Yeah, I know. I knew it was rough. I knew it was like, you know, I mean, I'm not saying it's the same as going through the Navy SEALs, but the intensity back then may have been somewhat close on some parts. But, you know, boot camp changed. When I was in boot camp in uh, 87, they were yelling at me, cussing at me, doing all that stuff like they did in your division. But later right. they stop. They get rid of that filthy language. <laughs> you know? but we have a sense of pride of of taking the abuse. You know what I mean? It's like, yeah, that's what a man does. That's what we were taught in our era. You know, yours more than yeah. mine. You know, yeah. um, I, I certainly know about that. I know things have changed. Um, well, yeah. well, you know, Lynn, to give you an idea of the things that they trained me to do, I was over in Guam, and we uh, we came under fire. Uh, there were some intruders. We, they thought uh, at this particular time uh, we had run-ins with Japanese uh, that were left over from the Second World War that were still there. And uh, the gunnery sergeant and I were going up, running up the fire break. It was at night, and uh, uh, there was a corporal, and some of the guys stayed behind, and uh, we were running up the road, and all of a sudden, somebody started firing, and the BAR opened up, and uh, the gunny hit the deck and rolled and came up. He had a shotgun. I had my M1 rifle, and I had been told not to load it unless we came under fire. And when I hit the deck and came... So you were, you were telling me that you were um, on the base, and there were still some of those uh, 
some of the Japanese people from like the Pearl Harbor era that were still thinking they were in war and they were trying to break into the base you were at? Well, no, they li- they lived out there. They lived out there, they, but sometimes they would fire on our guys. And so they lived on Guam? They were still, oh, yeah, they were, were they soldiers from, yeah. from World War II left over? Oh, yes. Uh, they uh, uh, they uh, captured one just before we got there, uh, and they uh, sh- shot and killed one just before I left. After my tour was over. And then I think in 1976, the last one came down and gave himself up. So there was a bunch of guys that were hiding out like they were still in the war, even though it was like 15 years later or 20 years later. Right. And they were they were living in Guam in some little hideout or something. Yeah, they were living in caves up there. And so that so the Japanese had landed on Guam at one point. I didn't know this. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it was a major uh, it was a major battle later on. And uh, uh, I talked to guys that lived there after the, you know, shortly after the war. Uh, their fathers were stationed there or whatever, and they said that constantly the Marines were uh, chasing Japanese through the through the clotheslines and stuff out the back door, you know. <laughs> they'd come into town wow. to steal stuff, and uh, they, they'd go into town, and uh, uh, sometimes they go to the bars and everything. I, uh, I understand. I can't verify that, but uh, we, we found out that they would sneak into town and steal food, that kind of stuff, but... Uh, yeah, the the last guy uh, gave himself up. He uh, he said his uh, his friend had died, and that was it. And uh, uh, the uh, glasses he had glasses uh, left over from the war, and the and the uh, frames had broken, and he made he made wooden frames for his glasses so he could wear them. So so part of your for your second detail after you were doing the repairman job. Is that you were you were stationed in Guam to do security for a high classified area, and these guys were trying to break into that, right? That's what you were saying. Oh, they were in it. They were they were living in it. We built a security area around them. <laughs> oh my goodness! <laughs> they, were, they were like rabbits that were living there, and we you know we came in and built the farm around the rabbits. You know, that's because I've been to Guam and I had no idea that you were having shootouts on that island. <laughs> I mean, so, oh, yeah, yeah. So, so, and we had shootouts with the, with the, with the uh, Guamanians too, because, uh, uh, a very large deer population and pig population, uh, was up there and they would come up and poach. But my God, we had, uh, 16 inches and all that kind of stuff sitting around outside, you know, bullet in the wrong damn place was not, was not a good thing. And plus it was, uh, yeah, uh, you know, it was a secret area. I mean, it was, uh, wow. You know, it was highly uh, classified stuff that was going on there. And these guys were coming in and shooting up the place and, and, and they get mad at the, at the Marines or the sailors and they shoot at the trucks and that kind of stuff. Wow. So you guys were under constant threat from either the leftover Japanese soldiers that still thought they were at war from World War right. Two, from World War Two. And this is in the sixties or. What what era is it? Yes, on nineteen sixty to nineteen sixty one to nineteen sixty two, I was there. Wow! And then you had uh, then you had the locals that were mad because they do like those. They like to do their barbecues, get their pigs. They like to hunt. They live off the That's land. That's correct. So you guys right. took you took away like, hey, we're going to take fifty percent of your pigs. Sorry, <laughs> you're like, right. hey, give those back to us. You know, right? And we were here first. I understand. I totally, I have friends, I have friends that are Guamanian that, you know, came from there that I later, I went to high school with because their dad got a job in the army and he ran the commissary and, you know, Frank and John Rosario and Lilani Rosario. And we still, we're still in touch on Facebook. It's funny. You know, it's like, you know, we, um, and I've been to Guam because I did a lot of Westpacs. So Uh I did too, but I passed through there like four or five or eight times. I'm not sure exactly on the way, like either from here to the Philippines or Hawaii to Guam or depending what our, our mission was. So yeah, it's a tiny little Island. I mean, how long, so you oh, were, yeah. what did you do for fun in Guam? <laughs> uh, we drank a lot. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, uh, we, uh, we did, uh, uh, they, they did, uh, some of the guys who went to boxing, that kind of stuff. Yeah, but uh, most of the time, I I made friends with uh, with uh, some Hawaiian people there who uh, owned the bar, 
Mm-hmm. <laughs> and uh, Jack uh, called, made me uh, his cousin. My, I called him my island uncle. <laughs> and uh, uh, I would go and spend the weekends with uh, with his he and his family and uh, uh, down there and uh, uh, help around the the bar and around the house. Uh, sometimes I chaperoned his daughters and and uh, their boyfriends and so forth. Uh, th- when That's they went out cool. on dates and everything. Oh wow! Uh, you were a human human chastity belt. Nice. There you go. <laughs> there you go. I don't know how I don't know how good I was at it, but uh, you know it's pretty, it's pretty cool having having those guys for your fun. There was a guy named Kalei, and Kalei was he was a monster. Well, they yeah. all were. They were huge men, beautiful men. They had wonderful voices and stuff. And I remember there was a party there. The kids were having a party on the beach, and a bunch of sailors came down and wanted to crash the party. You know, there was a bunch of young girls and the whole thing. You know, what the heck? Why not? And they came yeah. on there. Well, the the Hawaiian adult males were up on the on the side of the hill, and they came down and they said, uh, "Hey, Ollie, uh, <laughs> and head on down the road, you know." And they said no. And one of them picked up one of these sailors and threw him. I mean, like it like was a football. baseball, you know, just <laughs> pitched him. And these guys started running. Well, these Hawaiian guys are two, three hundred pound men. You know, they're huge guys. And they yeah. they could run like deer. And these poor sailors are running, and these guys are running them down, grabbing them by the nap of the neck, and just throwing them into the dirt, into the sand. Wow. <laughs> it was a disaster. It was a massacre is what it was. And then they came back and got their <laughs> ukuleles out and they sang and played and we drank beer and, and the sailors went off, <laughs> limped off down the road. But I was truly impressed with their abilities. <laughs> they were wonderful guys. That, I, I got to say, like, I, I understand the code of the islands. Um, <clears throat> and for anybody that ever gets stationed there or visits there, you got to give respect to get respect. That's yep. how the island works. Yep. You got to understand it. this is their island. And if you're respectful, they'll treat you like a king. But if you're a jerk, uh, they will notice it very fast. Oh, yeah. And you will be, you will be called on it. And so we, we had warnings when our ship pulled in. They said, be careful. Don't provoke the locals. Don't follow anybody down an alley who's inviting you to a party. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and don't hitchhike and don't hitchhike. Yeah. And there we are. And me and my friends had gotten lit. You know, we were buzzed off our ass on some beer right outside the front gate. And what are we doing? We're hitchhiking. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we're going. And we were sitting there looking at each other. Is this where it happens? Is this where we get taken for the beating? <laughs> you know, yeah. and, but I'm, but I'm a negotiator. And, and then, like I told you, I grew up overseas. It gives you traveling and, and, you know, ambassador skills to negotiate and befriend people of other places. Right. right. So this Chamorro guy pulls up and I'm like, hi, how are you? Uh, we're trying to go to a good nightclub. I have a proposition for you. We're going to be here for two or three nights. If you pick us up every night, we'll pay for your gas. We'll pay for your dinner. We'll all pay for your drinks. And if you look out for us, we'll definitely, you know, appreciate anything you can do. And he's like, shoots, bro, come, <laughs> you know, and for the rest of the time, well, well, other guys were getting their heads thumped at Barney's Beach House, you know, by the huge, uh, you know, WWE sized, uh, Samoan, Guamanians and so go. forth. <laughs> we were being treated with love and respect because we were given it. And, and I, and that's, you know, I just went to Hilo not too long ago with a bunch of, uh, Hawaiian fighters. And it's different when you're there with the locals and their families. It is such an enriching experience. Then they go there as a tourist who's staying at the, kind of poly in and Maui or whatever, you know, it's just a different vibe. Right. All right. So you, you had that experience too. Where did you go from Guam? Well, Guam, I guess sent right back to uh, Camp Pendleton, almost the same bunk <laughs> uh, when I got back and uh, I went back to, uh, to the shop uh, working on firearms and then uh, Cuba broke out. Bay of Pigs. And we went on lockdown and I uh, got sent off to Cuba for the Cuban missile Crisis. Wow. So there's like a base there, right? <clears throat> is, is that Gitmo? What's the name of that base? I, I get the bases mixed up in my head. So. Guantanamo? Guantanamo. That's what I meant to say. Yeah. That's the base and a few good men, right? Yes. 
And what yes, uh, they took part of our guys and they uh, uh, they flew them over. Uh, at that time, I, my understanding is it was the fastest troop movement uh, uh, in history because the Marines were taken from Camp Pendleton, flown over there. Within 24 hours of notice, they were locked and loaded and on the line. So there was that fence line between you guys and Cuba. Right. Right. There was a double fence, I understand. Uh, the guys that uh, from my unit that were there, uh, they said that uh, uh, the Marines and some sailors, <laughs> God, <laughs> Uh, it's a wonder the world's still here because of that. But anyway, the they uh, decided that uh, what they had done is taken trees and turned into uh, giant slingshots with inner tubes. Wow! And they were shooting shooting rocks at the at the Cubans. Ah! Well, that wasn't that wasn't enough. So a couple of a bunch of the Marines and the sailors uh, grabbed the hold of a PC, uh, you know, a, a weapons carrier. A truck, and they drove through the fence into no man's land, drove across, and the back of it was full of rocks, and they stoned through rocks at the Cubans as they went by. Now, these guys are locked and loaded just like we were, and they're throwing rocks at these guys, and then turned around and sped back across no man's land, hit a landmine, blew the back axle off the truck. They bailed out and ran back across the line. Wow, that sounded yeah. like an un- un- unauthorized attack there to me. I think it was yes. <laughs> so, so these guys were these guys were geared up, right? Yeah, they were geared up. Uh, they were tired of waiting around and getting bit by mosquitoes and the rest of it, I guess. But there was crazy stuff like that going on all the time, and it, you know, now we look back on it and find out how close we were to a real end of uh, time type of thing. They had nuclear devices that were uh, uh, zeroed in on the beaches. Had we landed, none of us would have survived it, it looks like, because they had nukes there, and they had them wow. lined up on the beaches. We, none of us would have survived that. Wow. It wasn't, It wasn't. you know, that was where Kennedy was working his magic. Yeah. And uh, his statue is right down the street from where my mom lives in Cape Cod. Makes me think about that. And that was like a height, height part of the higher part of the Cold War. Yes. Which, which today it's kind of like how Putin feels about us having troops in the Ukraine. It's like them landing in Cuba. Right. Like, well, what was our whole war? Our whole premise of war during your generation and mine was to kill communism from growing all over the world. Right. But honestly, we should just let it be because it doesn't work. (laughs) <laughs> we yeah. just, we yeah. should just let it kill itself. Yeah, you know? but the, the interim yeah. was real was real toxic too. <laughs> yeah, you know, well, all people the died proxy... while they were finding out that it didn't work. So true, and and all the the proxy wars that we had, right? Oh well, yeah. Um, and now I actually I was reading an article because I did a an interview with a gentle two gentlemen that hung out with John Wayne on the uh, St. Paul where they filmed in harm's way. Uh huh. And they hung out with them every day. They had the same job as me, their signalman. So I'm looking up something on John Wayne, and they said that uh, one of the former Russian leaders had a hit out on John Wayne because of his, you know, the way he came across in movies, you know what I mean? <laughs> and, and, then, and then another guy came into office, and he says, I liked his movies too much. I took that. I killed that order. But there was like, you know, the FBI had warned him and all kinds of stuff, and he's like, let him come. You know, <laughs> he's just one of those guys. <laughs> But 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 here's the great irony, you know, we we're, we're seeing stuff like Boris and Natasha cartoons as kids, Boris and Natasha, we're spies, like we'll kill all the Americans, right? Right. And then I'm married to a, a beautiful Russian woman. She wasn't part of that. That was the warring governments, armies, military, those people, right? Right. So it's it's a it's a trip when you take it all apart. Like what was that all about? But. You know, it is about resources. It is about who dominates the world. It is about money. It is about quality of life. Uh, it's, it's crazy where we get sent and what we end up doing. So tell me more about Pendleton before I keep going on this tangent here. <laughs> well, no, what, what was going on over there? It was just like work. <laughs> right? It was, just, you know, 
We get up in the morning, go to the shop and work, uh, work, go, go have lunch, go back down and work and then head for town. It, it was just like having a job. I mean, it was, uh, you know, we were working in the factory and we were working with guns all the time. Kind of like shore duty for the Navy. Yeah. Yeah. When you get, yeah, that's what it's like. You're back home stateside. Um, Pendleton, pretty nice area around there. Uh, I I thought it was pretty pretty neat. I mean, it was uh, at the time it was uh, well kept up, and uh, uh, and it was uh, it was Cold War, but it was uh, peacetime. It was a whole different way of, uh, of things were a whole lot different than they are now. Uh, well, just a short few years later with uh, with Vietnam and so forth, you know. Uh, the, all the places where I worked have all been decommissioned now. They're not; they don't even exist anymore. And I think Pendleton's the last one there, right? Yeah. yeah what, it's so a huge I mean, place. P- Pendleton, you had the beach though. How did you like the California life coming from Michigan? Oh, I loved it. Yeah, I stayed out there for a long time. Uh, uh, used to, <laughs> I remember one, one night we got oh god, we got tanked up on, that, on cheap. Uh, on cheap uh, wine, I think it was seventy-five cents a gallon Drink. or something like that. <laughs> uh, it, was, it was terrible stuff, you know. But uh, well, we've been drinking, and uh, the guy said, "Let's go body surfing." And so we went down down on the, on the beach and took all of our clothes off, and we're romping around out there and body surfing and. Uh, uh, you know, watching, uh, riding the waves in. It's like three o'clock in the morning. And, uh, all of a sudden cops show up. <laughs> you know, we're on somebody's private beach. And so here we are running down the beach with our clothes in our arms, butt ass naked, <laughs> but have no idea where we are. And we're running like crazy. Cops are chasing us. We're running in between and in and out of the houses and the whole thing up and down streets over fences and, and so forth. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And the, and the poli- we finally lost the police, and they went away. And it's like an hour and a half later, you know, we come sneaking out, and one of the guys turns around and he says, "I don't know where the car is." <laughs> <laughs> hey, what do you mean you don't know where the car is? <laughs> it, took, it took us a half an hour. Luckily, we got our clothes back on, <laughs> going up and down the streets looking. Looking for the, looking for the car. Finally found it and took off back to Pendleton. <laughs> but uh, those are the kind. Those are the things that we used to do for entertainment. Well, I'm going to give you a piece of advice from my special Navy training. It was my. <laughs> <laughs> this is before the Navy. I've done the same thing where some girls dared us to run naked in the beach or something, uh, and, and the, they were like, "Just me and my buddy. We ran out there. We'd been drinking. We're in the ocean." All of a sudden, we see, this is in Italy, we see the police carbonieri jeep cruising down, you know, cruising down the beach, like, what the hell's going on over there? <laughs> and we're out in the ocean. I'm like, dude, and we get a bottle of Amaretto. <laughs> we're in the waves. And I go, here, grab some kelp. So we became some sea creatures. We put it all over our heads, <laughs> like a ghillie suit in the ocean. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Camouflage. Camouflage. <laughs> Well, we were there for about, we were, yeah, of course you are. <laughs> but we were there for about ten minutes, looking like sea creatures, drinking amaretto. Uh, I tell that story to anybody else. <laughs> yeah, right. You, you uh, never did that one. I don't want to yeah, hear about it. <laughs> yeah, 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 right, right. I got my buddy Fred. I'll have to find him to verify. But uh, <laughs> yeah, you know yeah. that was. A, Go ahead. So so. So California living compared to Michigan, what else did you like about it? I mean, the weather, the vibe, what was going on in that time? You were there in the 60s? I was there in the 60s, yeah. It was, uh, uh, you know, it was, a, it was funny because when we first landed in, in California on our way to boot camp, the first thing anybody noticed, and we were all from the, from the you know, Michigan, Detroit area and everything, were shower shoes. There were shower yeah. shoes everywhere. We couldn't, you know, what the hell? Everybody wore shower shoes. They didn't wear shoes. They wore shower shoes. And that, that baffled us. And then at that time, there was a, a, a Harry Krishners or whatever they were selling flowers. And 
and all that. Oh. Uh, they were all there in their saffron robes and all that sort of thing trying to... <laughs> trying to recruit you. Trying to recruit. Right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, if I'd been smart, I probably would have gone with them, but no, I went on to <laughs> <laughs> Come to our tent, chant with us. Yes. <clears throat> Meet all the ladies you want, and eat. we'll just eat lettuce and build a family. Right. Right. But <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's funny you bring that up because I mentioned it in other podcasts, is that there was always some type of cult waiting for you outside the base. Oh. Like we had Scientologist girls. Hey, sailors, want to go for a ride? We're going to a meeting. We're going to a meeting. I'm like... I don't need to go to a meeting. I'm going on Liberty. You want to go to the bar? We don't drink. I'm like, well, well, you're not our kind of gal. See you later. You know, um, same thing. But you were there in the 60s. So that was, oh, man, you're coming up on the Helter Skelter era yeah. and the Beach Boys and all that vibe. Was that the vibe going on back then? Oh, yeah. Yeah. You know, uh, the sheriff's department that I work for, uh, uh, our guys were the ones that captured Charlie Manson. Oh, wow. I didn't know that. Yeah. 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 I got one for you. I went to high school with Sharon Tate. Well, I didn't go with her. She uh -huh. went to my high school. She's older than me. Right. And then she's since, since deceased, the poor lady, but she went to our high school in the 60s. I'll be darned. In Italy. Yeah. I yeah. I think your dad was a military guy. Yeah. Hmm? Yeah. Yeah. That I, was, I found uh, out last night on, on uh, Together We Served uh, site. Are you familiar with that? Yeah, I am. Yeah, well, they. Uh, I was looking at to uh, see if anybody uh, who I went through boot camp with uh, was uh, had uh, signed on or not. And I was going down through there, and I found out for the first time that uh, while I was in boot camp, a guy by the name of uh, Heath, Heathcock was there at the same time. Okay. Yeah, White Feather. Oh yeah, yeah. There was a there was a lot of. Uh, I served with uh, about three or four. American Indians on my ship, and well, I'm still he, friends with most of them. Yeah, They're cool guys. Yeah, no, he was a, he was the number one sniper. Wow, he's the one that they wrote, you know, one shot, one kill. Yeah, yeah, we we were in boot camp together. <laughs> I didn't even know it until I looked at it. Wow. Yeah. <clears throat> You're like, wait a second, that's a celebrity in the military. Oh yeah, he's, he's quite a guy. He was quite a guy. Yeah. Yeah. So you're 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 fixing the arms in San Diego, and is that your last duty station before you get out, or do you go somewhere else? You went to Cuba. You told me you went to Cuba. Yeah, we went to Cuba, came back, and I was there for a few more months, and then uh, uh, then I got out of the corps and uh, uh, got married and and uh, went to work for uh, Weber's Bread Company. And okay. while I was in Weber's Bread Company, they got the. Uh, uh, the contract for uh, China Lake uh, Commissary of the China Lake uh, Naval Weapons Center. And I went up there in the city of Ridgecrest, which is right next door to, to uh, China Lake. Uh, they incorporated and started hiring police officers, and I uh, took the test and uh, went to work there. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> All that security training. So your your time in as a Marine was how many years? Four. Four? Four years, 59 to 63. So you went from Guam, you went to Cuba, and you went back to Pendleton, and then poof, you're a cop. I'm a cop. <laughs> and, you, and, you, and you did that for a long time, like before? Be I, I, I was a police officer for about uh, five or six years and started to starve to death. Back then, you had to buy your own uniforms, and all. they, they issued you a firearm. And uh, if you were lucky, you got a uh, – uh, some. at that time, they were uh, issuing helmets. But that was the only thing you got. Everything else you had to purchase yourself, and you made about $8,500 a year. Wow. And, what, and so – What uh, year is this? Mid-60s? Huh? Is this like mid to late yeah. 60s? Right. Uh, I got out in 63, became a police officer in 62. And so, yeah, right on through up to about 68, uh, 69, somewhere in there. And so wow. uh, I uh, I quit the department and went to work uh, in heavy construction driving ukes. Yeah. The big earth. What is a uke? Oh, you're talking like those huge things. Yeah. Yeah, the great big ones. Yeah. 
Yeah, you could park two two pickup trucks and side by side in the bed. Wow. <laughs> the, yeah. Like the Tonka trucks that they gave kids, but grown up ones. I get grown, it. Grown up yeah. Tonka. All right, there you go. <laughs> yeah. So that was a that was a fun career for a while. You like well, that? It, it, it was uh, interesting. Uh, on my thirtieth birthday, I'm going up this hill. It was made. Uh, uh, we were pioneering in Death Valley, uh, a road out there, and I'm going up the the side of the mountain on a, on a uh, freshly made road that they had made to get up to the top. And when you got up to the top, the guy would get off the front end loader, which was as big as our truck anyway, and he'd get down and he'd show you how to turn your wheels and then pull you and signal you to come forward and back up and so forth and get you lined up. But when you sit on this little plateau that they had up there to, where you were going to get loaded, you were like sitting in midair while you're in that truck. There was nothing on to your left except straight down for several hundred feet. In front of you was nothing but sky. You couldn't see any road or anything. And they started loading you up. And then when they got you loaded up, the guy got off of the loader again, stood in front of you, and he'd line your wheels up on a road that you could not see. Oh, wow. And he'd say, go, and you'd take off and then – the truck would break over the top of that hill, and then you'd be able to see the road so you could drive down. And it was like a rolling. Yeah, just like going up a ramp with no no bottom in sight. Well, I went up that road, I get it. and the road gave way. And the whole, front, wow. the whole front of the truck went up in the air. And so here I am sitting like I'm ready to blast off to the moon. And I got the handbrake oh on, the foot brake on, and I'm there, and the truck is rocking back and forth on the rear axles because there are only two axles. And it's rocking back and forth straight up in the air. And the guy who was on the uh, on the slope cap, he saw me. He was, <clears throat> excuse me, had to be one of the bravest guys I ever saw. He came down off of that off of that mountain when he turned. To go along, you know, run parallel, one track came up. That's how steep it was. And he came around and pinned me to the, to the side of the mountain. They built the road back. They really wow. built the road back up to me and then pick up the back end of the truck and push me back up the hill where I went up the top of the hill and they, uh, they went and uh, rebuilt the road and then we went back to work. But I thought wow. I, that was uh, that was one day that I truthfully believed that I was I was that was the last day that was it. <laughs> That's heavy. Yeah. yeah. So you, you did you did that you did that for a while, and and I read your bio. I mean, you did a lot of things, but then you later you later went back into your police and marine work by doing security, right? Well, yeah, I I, I went back. To, uh, the earth the earthquake hit, and my wife. Uh, uh, got terrified. The house split down the middle and all that kind of stuff. And uh, she wanted California. To, well, yeah, she wanted to go back to Michigan. So I loaded everybody up in the car and back to Michigan. We went with the idea we were coming back. We never did. <laughs> God, never did. <laughs> That's why I haven't left yet. Yeah. California, you leave. There's no comebacks yeah, usually. Yeah. So uh, when I was there, I, I worked. In, I got into foundry work. And I uh, worked my way up from uh, from a molder up to uh, to a uh, to superintendent of the uh, plant, and uh, yeah. and then uh, uh, things kind of went to hell in a handbasket. There they ended up uh, divorced, and uh, they had a big uh, they had a you know uh, crises in the uh, automobile industry, and the foundries were going down because of all the uh, they. Uh, uh, the tree huggers wanted the, the foundries to shut down because they were polluting the air and all this sort of thing. And so uh, I went to uh, a friend of mine who was in the uh, paper industry. He said, John, he said, uh, while well, you're out of work, he said, would you come here and maybe do a little training in uh, supervision? So I went there. Uh, they, they put me on the third shift. I didn't know shit about paper. Didn't know a damn thing about making paper. And... Uh, by the time I got done uh, firing people and getting things around, uh, I have a letter that says I increased production by 45%. Wow. 
and they asked wow. me if I would stay. <laughs> and uh, they gave they gave <laughs> me quite a quite a nice job uh, as uh, head of security and uh, 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 industrial buyer. And so I. Yep. Uh, people uh, were breaking into places around there and everything, and and security was uh, expensive for the smaller companies. So I went around to the other guys and I said, "How about if uh, if we all chipped in together and bought security and uh, paid for security, and we'll patrol all of your places against it, you know, against uh, burglary and stuff." Well, that's when that's when I found yeah. out that they were paying fifty dollar fines for false false alarms, and I said, "Hmm." So wow. I started checking around. I had some friends on the police department. And I found out how many hundreds of alarms they had a month, and so I put two trucks on and uh, got my license because of my background as a, as a private detective and a uh, and a head of security. Bought a security uh, started a security company. And started answering alarms. Within a year, I had 105 people working for me. I had uh, office in uh, in Tokyo, one in London, one in uh, San Diego, and one in New York. Wow! All from learning how to oh, fix guns yeah. in the Marines. I'm kidding. <laughs> That's that was the name of the game. You know, build on what you got. <laughs> Right, yeah. exactly. You're like, this is a lot like fixing a, a rifle. No I'm kidding. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah, sarcastic. Absolutely, but that's that's the way it started, you know. And uh, we amazing. Uh, and, and it just seemed like I met people uh, who who could do things. Uh, I got I, I I met a guy who worked for for a, a state senator, and they were going to have yeah. an investigation on on. Uh, how alcohol and drugs affected the youth of Michigan. And they were going to have a, have an investigation okay. on that before the Senate investigation or whatever, but state, you know, that kind of stuff. And so he asked me if I'd be the chairman of it. I said, sure, mm-hmm. I'll give it a try, you know. And they said, we want you to try and find some people <laughs> who are who are named people. You know, big big names. And I thought, yeah, Battle Creek, Michigan. Yeah, I'm going to know a lot of high end people here. Well, at that <laughs> at that time, uh, oh, what's his name? Uh, I can't think. Uh, Sundance and uh, Sundance Kid. You know, uh, Paul, uh, Paul Robert Newman. Redford. Paul Newman. Paul Newman, Paul Newman. Uh, okay. uh, daughter yeah. was testifying before Congress uh, uh, about uh, drug addiction because her brother had uh, died, you know, from a drug overdose. And I said, "Why not?" So I made a mm-hmm. call, <laughs> and sure enough, she got on the line, and I said, uh, "Would you be interested in testifying?" <laughs> <laughs> yes, I would. <laughs> I said, Gosh, you know everybody. <laughs> I guess he who dares wins, right? <laughs> I, I agree with this. You know, isn't that that's, the that's, SAS credo? Right. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the British Special right. Forces credo, right there. Yeah, but it's a good yeah. one, and I uh, like it. And so that went in the paper, <clears throat> and people started knowing my name. And then uh, uh, a guy came to me uh, whose son needed a heart lung transplant, and uh, he uh, yeah. but they had the, the place the only place that was going to do a heart lung transplant was Pennsylvania, and uh, he wow. said we're having a hard time trying to get him there. You know, I said let me make a couple phone calls. So I got a hold of a guy who I'm still friends with, who, as a matter of fact, is coming here in May to spend a few days with us here, Richie, and uh, he's a pilot. And by the time we got by the time we got done nice. that day, we had private pilots who were on call twenty four seven, and they were that way for two years to fly that kid out. <clears throat> wow. <Excuse me. laughs> Got a dry throat here. That's, anyway, uh, and, and he actually, that's okay. uh, and, and they, uh, I left the company 
and that was still in place. And they called, and sure enough, they flew in there and got in there for the heart lung transplant. It's very interesting because we were talking earlier like, wow, we could do everything together because <laughs> you know what? You, you, you want to know what the common thread, what I believe in, you're a problem solver, you know, and I tell people to adapt that mentality because otherwise, if you're not a problem solver, you're just a reactor. You're right. just reacting to circumstance. Right. So if you want to build something as we're going to the next level where you talk about your big security company, you're a problem solver. doesn't matter. Like, how'd you know this celebrity? I just made a phone call. Right what you do, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. you know, it's present the facts in a likable, good manner where people find it appealing. Right. You know, and, uh, that's what I believe. You know, most, and if you do the job and show up on time, it's like you're a miracle worker being on time in, the, in this country and doing what you say you're going to do. And maybe a little bit more. Time. People just go crazy over that. 